Welcome to Commune. We are on a mission to inspire, heal, and bring the world closer together. John Lewis, Keegan Coon, good to be with you. Thanks, Thanks for having us. Having us man. Yeah, well, thank you guys for making this extraordinary documentary. They're trying to kill us. Um, I really uh, found it um, enlightening in so many different places. Um, and uh, I want to go into a lot of it. I mean, just the title of the film um, is pregnant with questions. Uh, it, it automatically makes me want to ask, who are they? Uh, who is us? And what does it mean by this killing? How is that transpiring? Um, so, uh, so there's a lot of threads uh, from the film I want to pull on. For example, like what are the primary killers in the United States? Uh, what is the correlation between some of these killer diseases and, and diet and food systems? Uh, what are the demographic groups that are most impacted um, by disease prevalence? What are some of the forces and um, alignment of forces that are responsible for the perpetuation of systems of disease? Uh, what is the relationship between culture and disease? And obviously, we'll get into to some of the solutions um, because I do believe that there is an optimis optimistic message that you're also um, dealing. Uh, but maybe as a way to scaffold the conversation, both of you could provide a little background about how you've come to be experts uh, on these topics and maybe um, explore the circumstances that, that brought you guys together uh, as a team and and since the documentary is is by some measure a biopic of John's life, maybe John, you want to just take it and kick it off for a minute. Um, yeah, uh, thanks again for having us. Uh, would have to say that you know my journey to veganism was uh, unique in my sense, but I've known I've noticed that the longer and longer I've been vegan, I hear the same story over and over. Uh, I, my mother was diagnosed with colon cancer and. You know, learning more about how, you know, this disease inf in infected her and how it became a part of her body, uh, learning, you know, asking doctors questions and finding out that like animal protein was a major contributor. Um, that's what led me to basically, you know, saying to myself, like, I'm a big believer in learning from uh, my mistakes, but I'm a bigger believer in learning from other people's mistakes. So I hated it had to be my mom, but at the same time, I, I saw that if I could actually avoid this journey, then why not? Or, or even even if I couldn't avoid it 100%, my percentages of avoiding it were higher by going this route. So why not do that? And then that's what led me down that path. And I didn't go vegan to start a company. I didn't go vegan to influence anybody else. It literally was a selfish reason. And then the, the more and more I, I dove into the lifestyle, I saw, well, wait a minute, this is helping me out. You know, my knees don't hurt as much. Uh, my skin is clearing up. My stomach issues are clearing up. I got to share this. And then that's how it all started. Mm, nice. And Keegan, uh, I know that this has been a topic that has been the subject of your work for, well, decades, as far as uh, I know. So can you uh, enlighten us a little bit about how you got interested in this and then how you and John got hooked up? Yeah, I was um, really fortunate to be raised um, w from a very conscientious mom, and she raised us all vegetarian. And at a very young age, uh, I became plant-based vegan. And the, the reason for that is she told us, basically had two rules, which is don't hurt anybody and question authority. And when I found out about the what dairy farmers do to dairy cows and what chicken farmers do to egg laying chickens. I thought, well, that doesn't fit into this, you know, don't hurt anybody. And, um, the question authority fit in really nicely for questioning the, you know, the mainstream narrative that we're told all the time. Um, and so I, yeah, for the last, I mean, most of the majority of my life since about 12 years old, I have been dedicated to this cause and raising as much awareness as possible and, and showing people the intersections of oppression for non-human animals, the environment and for human beings. John and I were super fortunate to be friends for a while, and we met through um, actually at Greenfest, and we started talking about doing a film together. And John was super excited about working together, and he said, "Hey, let's do something that you know really targets the African American community." 
and came up with this brilliant idea of utilizing hip hop as the way to do that. That not only is hip hop, you know, predominantly an African American art form, um, and a lot of African Americans listen to this music, but it influences culture cr- around the world. You know, it's it, it probably more than any other art form really influences its fans because fans follow hip hop artists and and mirror the, how they eat, how they drink, what they drive, what they wear, and so looking at that and realizing that so many hip hop artists and particularly influential hip hop artists are plant based or food conscious or health conscious, we thought, well, that's the perfect avenues to elevate their voices even further to talk about these important subjects. And then as the film does, it follows John on this journey, asking this question, why is it that Americans of color suffer from disproportionately higher rates of chronic disease than European Americans, you know, two times more likely to die from diabetes and 30% more likely to die from heart disease, 60% more likely to die from stroke, you know, on and on and on pretty basically any statistic, health statistic, African Americans suffer worse. And why is that? And so the film is this whole investigative journey trying to figure out and seeing the intersections of diet, disease, poverty, institutionalized racism, government collusion with industry. I mean, it is a massive 108 minute long film that goes into a lot of different subjects. Yeah. It's uh, beautifully executed and, and coming really through a very unique and differentiating lens. I mean, to be candid, I would not, automatically associate hip hop with veganism at first blush. Um, and so that was one of the kind of most astounding and eye opening elements of the film from the beginning. And, and was that uh, obvious to you, um, that, that correlation, uh, and in perhaps just kind of the mainstream is, is missing that, um, consilience. You know, I, I'm, I felt it. Oh, 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 yeah, right. sorry. Go ahead, John. No, go ahead. <laughs> no, I was just saying. I felt from the from day one that there were a lot of people that didn't get their correlation, and that was why it was important to lay that foundation for people to see that you know you're you're over there watching what they drink and what they wear and where they travel to and even who they date. You know. You know your kid. You know their kids' birthdays better than you know your own kids. Like they follow everything. It's like, well, what if you knew about what they eat? You know, and even if even if like a lot of these artists aren't full time vegan, you see them. Okay, they're about to go on tour, so they start training and they start going vegan. So they understand the power of it. They may not do it all the time, but they understand the power of it. So it was like, let's share this power. Yeah, well, I think there's a quote, I might get it wrong, but um, it's like, hip hop is the CNN of the hood yeah. <laughs> or something. Yeah. And I was like, that just landed so right on. And and yeah, I wonder if you could kind of just pull on that thread for a minute. I mean, what is, you know, the cultural significance of, of hip hop in America and the solution and the role that it can, it can play? Um, you know, as a solution to some of the problems that we're going to unpack, you know, over the next, you know, hour or so. Um, you know, I, I guess just the, the the natural reach of some of the personalities uh, in it. But 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 do you see like the message um, changing? You know, as as kind of part of the content and part of the lyrics, or is it just kind of people emulating the lifestyle of their of their heroes? How do you see it? Um, well, to, to kind of go to the first part of the question, I think, you know, with the CNN, you know, with rap being the CNN of the hood, that's exactly what it was. You know, hip hop was, was meant to be a voice, an outlet, you know, where, you know, you weren't hearing about a lot of this stuff on the news. So it was like CNN let you know, you know, if the police wasn't necessarily, about F the police, it was, don't get me wrong. But at the same time, it was also saying, hey, look, this is how they're doing this. This is wrong. And this is why we don't mess with them. You know, when it came to, uh, you know, self-destruction uh, by Public Enemy, you know, you got all these different songs that were, you know, like were headed to self-destruction. Like, all these messages are in these songs. It's just, it was so aggressive that people from the outside of that bubble just thought that it was all bad. It's like, no, no, no. It was talking to the people it wasn't all about like, hey, go kill somebody. Oh, go steal from somebody. It was also about let's raise this community. Let's get better. Let's get healthy. You know, 
Tupac has a great line, which uh, Carl Tellis actually talks about in the movie where it says, you know, you know, we have to improve the way we eat, the way we, you know, how we treat our people. We have to do that. So it's always been that message there. Um, I'll let Keegan answer the rest of it, but I definitely want to uh, let people understand that the message of hip hop has always been to uplift. Yeah. And I think we've seen hip hop shift in recent years because of the marketability. And then you see, you know, outside influences influencing it. And, you know, we talked to stick, um, from dead prez. And he talked about how, you know, they were, they were kind of put into this like conscious hip hop bracket. And you talk about where the record labels would send them on tour versus where they would send, you know, these more like street rappers. Right. And they would send them to the white skate parks. And he's like, we, why aren't you sending us to the black communities? Um, and so you see how like institutionalized racism and the narrative that major record labels wanted to perpetuate how they've done that. And so that's part of this film too, is that, you know, so many people, I think particularly in like the white American community see hip hop in a certain light because that's how it, the media has been portrayed or how it's been marketed, but realizing that this is incredible art form that not only, you know, involves rap, but it also involves, you know, different types of art, whether that's fashion or graffiti or break dancing or, you know, all the other elements of hip hop and food and health is part of that because food, you know, we all eat. And so how could hip hop not influence food and how could food not be influenced by hip hop? So, um, I think it's a, it's this incredible, important art form and that's, you know, happening in our lives times, you know, that we've seen the birth of this, this incredible art, influential art form. Yeah. Well, one of the things I found really compelling was the that the initial backdrop of the film, and, and I don't want to reveal too much about the film because everyone needs to go see it, but um, the, the initial backdrop is in Ferguson because, John, that's where you grew up in Ferguson, Missouri, and obviously Ferguson is highly associated with the use of deadly force by the police and made infamous by the the murder of Michael Brown, and you know that subsequently you know sparked the birth of the Black Lives Matter movement. And you know, I, I think that you know many mainstream white Americans have this picture of the inner city as as drug and gun infested. And I think there was a statistic in the movie that was just like jaw dropping of like the amount of gun dealers in the United States. I think it was something like 68,000. <laughs> it was almost like two to one over grocery stores. Um, yeah. And, you know, I think one of the points that you guys make is, you know, particularly since the murder of, you know, George Floyd, there is increasing awareness of poli police brutality and the unjust use of deadly force. And while, you know, these, problems of institutional racism in the police force are profound and need to be addressed um, from a statistical perspective you're suggesting that there is a much bigger contributor to the decimation of well-being and, and the shortening of, of black and brown lives so can you expound a little bit just like kind of get into the meat and potatoes of you know pun intended of um like really what's going on from a disease perspective uh, in the Afro-American community? Yeah, I like to say, you know, the the best, there's a quote that somebody else says, and I'm not really religious, so I never, I, I kind of reworded the quote, but it says, I reword it to fit what, when I'm talking to people. I say, you know, the best brainwashing that's ever been pulled off is when the person never knows it happened. And so, you know, if you really look at it, it's like we've been brainwashed to believe that if you don't eat these certain foods, you're going to die. And if you start to even look at anything vegetable, uh, it's going to you're going to be, you know, deficient in all these nutrients and you're not going to survive and your 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 teeth are going to fall out and you're going to get weak. And, and it's the exact opposite of all of that. And it's it's we have to take a step back. I keep telling people that, you know, it took this country, and we're not even gonna talk about the world because the world is a part of everything, but this country, it took it 400 years to basically figure out that, you know what, it's probably not right if we like take certain people and, you know, act like they're our property and like, you know, rape them and kill them. And, you know, it took 400 years for them to realize that. 
So it's going to take them another 400 years to even do anything about it. And so the the premise of the film more like more than likely is to show people that, yes, they messed up, but we can't wait on them to correct it. We have to do this ourselves. And if we're going to do this ourselves, while they did create this brainwashing storm of information that makes us believe that we have to eat this certain way or, or we have to live this certain way, there are loopholes there. And when you see these loopholes, it's up to us to recognize them. And as people like Keegan, uh, yourself, myself, that know this, we have to share that information. Now, I don't have to be badgering and hurtful and angry when I relay the message, but I do have to relay the message in a way that is better received. So that's why I, I feel that the way we did this with this um, message will make sure that people listen to the story and not just close their door, you know, like we're the, you know, knocking on each door. Hey, I got a pamphlet for you. Take a look at it. Like, no, we're going to lay it out to where you actually are entertained, but you're learning at the same time. And and when you're talking about the death rate, you're talking about the things that are happening this way, you don't have to necessarily always present it in a, in uh, encyclopedia form. Why not give them a story form? And then they can mm-hmm. learn along the way. And so I kind of got off subject there, but I just want people to understand that that's one of the things that we did. And you mentioned earlier about um, about us having solutions in the film. I, that's one of the f- funniest comments that I've been reading, which I know you're not supposed to read the comments. I'm, I'm learning that. Don't read the comments <laughs> of the pages. But people are like, oh, I'm so tired of this narrative. When are we, what, what, when are we gonna talk about solutions? And I'm like, well, if you watch the film, we actually talk about the solutions. That, Keen to tell you, that was one of the first things I talked about when we did this film. I was like, I want to be solution-based. I don't want to just present the problem and then be like, all right, wait till the next movie. We'll talk about it later. Like, no, I want you to see that there's this great problem here, but guess what? We have a solution for that problem. Uh, and, you know, a big part of the, the film is it's like, you know, it's looking at the problem, you know, the disparity between health rates and health outcomes, you know, and, and one of the shocking things that's, you know, besides even just diet related things like, you know, what I mentioned before about rates of cancer and diabetes and heart disease, but also medical treatment, you know, that uh, African-American woman's four times more likely to die during childbirth than a white woman and her babies are more likely to die when cared for by black doctors or by white doctors than by black doctors. And, and so seeing how institutionalized racism plays a role in not only the food that people have access to, because that's a major component of this and that we go into deeply in the film that communities of color have less access to health promoting foods than European Americans, but how the systemic racism plays into the treatment they receive when people get sick, um, the ability to afford the healthcare, um, and then the history of, you know, why, why, you know, John talked about the brainwashing of being like what, being told what you're supposed to eat, but we go into the history, well, why are people eating this way? And, and I think that's a really important and impactful part of the film. Yeah, let's unpack that a little bit because it was uh, one piece of the film that, that I, I hadn't really connected those dots completely. And uh, I always look for those moments inside of, of, of creative work um, because we can go back and kind of unpack the, the prevalence of heart disease and cancer and stroke and diabetes and, and, and we can create all of the causation links between that and diet. But I think, you know, on a cultural level, these sort of, idea of soul food has become kind of romanticized in kind of Americana, if you will. And, you know, like barbecue and fried chicken and, and biscuits. I mean, it's so highly associated with like family and picnics and community and getting together. And it's, it's comfort food, not just in the sense of like, oh, it makes me feel warm on the inside, but it makes me kind of feel warm in connection. But unfortunately, a lot of that food is is uh, is very detrimental to our health and can be the source of a lot of these diseases and conditions. But I guess maybe if you could spend a little time actually um, unpacking what the origin 
of kind of soul food is, um, where does that actually come from in the United States? Because as you guys point out in the film, it certainly is not the predominant diet of West Africa. No, no. You know, the one thing about the origin of soul food and uh, food like it is that people don't realize is that trauma can create unity and, and a bond for people. And so when you're talking about slave food and you're talking about soul food, that was the reason why we're so closely tied to it is because of the trauma that happened with it, because of the 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 pain and the suffering. But the one thing about, you know, the black community, the Spanish community, black, black brown, whatever the case may be, even white, everybody. One thing about black people, though, I can tell you is that we know how to take, and I don't know what my cursing limit is on here, but I'm about to use it up. We All can good. take shit and turn it into something great. You know, <laughs> so what happens was, even though it was still gold cover shit, it was still shit. And so we made it into a delicacy. And we made it taste better. And we made it look better. We made it smell better. You know, chitterlings didn't just smell like the inside of a pig shit lining. And we made it cook a little better and, and smell a little better and taste better. The problem is, is that once we so co- so-called got out of that trauma, because we're still living in a stressful environment, once we got out of that trauma, we didn't let go of those traits. And then the brainwashing aspect of it is that now you have people to literally, if you don't eat that, they're like, what's wrong with you? Like, what is going on? Like, why would you, oh, my ancestors ate that forever and, and look at them. I'm like, yeah, you're all of our ancestors are dead. So let's not use them as a reference. So people like to use that. It's like, no, let's really go to the root cause is that you were forced to eat this. Now you're no longer forced to eat it, but you have an undue pressure from a dead person that's still telling you like, I got to eat this or my ancestors will be pissed at me. It's like, no, your ancestors did that. So hopefully you wouldn't have to do this, but we're still doing it. Yeah, you know, in the film, Dr. Milton Mills talks about how the the modern soul food is just a legacy of of human slavery in the United States, and that you know things like chitlins and pig's feet and pig skin were were the trash, you know, that the the enslavers gave to the enslaved, and they literally just gave them the garbage. And so, as Jack John said, is that you know they took this garbage and turned it into something culturally significant, something that is bound together. Um, and that has happened, you know, for all colonized people, anywhere you go in the world where European colonization has happened, they've, they've stripped culture and they've supplanted their own culture and people have found ways of bonding over that. But whether they're enslaved Africans or indigenous Americans or people in Southeast Asia or Australia or New Zealand or Aotearoa, it's like, this is what has happened. And so I think it's really important that we understand and acknowledge and respect that history has played a major role in what people are doing today and how people are choosing to eat um, while believing that it's a, a free choice, that there is a legacy of oppression that is right there on people's plates. Yeah. And this is such a, I think difficult and emotional part of the equation is of unwinding the desire to preserve culture and preserve tradition. It's really an emotional thing. I mean, there was a line in the film, again, I don't want to reveal too much, but I think it was something like, we're carrying the vestiges of slavery on our plates. Oh, man. I mean, that is deep. And um, so, you know, it, I want to talk about food deserts, for example, but it goes beyond food deserts. It goes into this really like emotional connection that binds people together. Um, and uh, and again, you know, this was not a connection that I, I made, you know, prior to watching the film. But, you know, if you go into sort of the traditional diets, indigenous diets, um, you know, they're almost always plant-based. I mean, certainly, as you guys point out, the traditional West African diet was a lot of plants, no dairy, um, very little meat or, you know, very um, little, you know, saturated fats a lot of whole grains, a lot of fiber, and guess what? No chronic disease, you know? And 
And it's it's not always a, a diet that's necessarily foisted upon people, although, I mean, it, you know, it depends kind of how you define the word foisted. But even in like the blue zones, like in Okinawa, Japan or something, where they've started to import the standard American diet, I mean, these were places, one of the few places left where people were thriving into their 90s and 100s um, psychologically and physically. And now we're seeing that kind of longevity being undermined by high processed foods, processed meats, lots of sugars, um, uh, et cetera. So, um, yeah, it's, uh, it's, it's, you know, and it, and it really, in, in some ways, and I think we'll, we'll get to this is sort of comes down to this alignment of forces that feels like inexorably marching forward between sort of big food and pharma and government and the revolving chairs that exist sort of, um, you know, within that hierarchy. But, but kind of before we, we get into they, who is they in the, they are trying to kill us. Um, you know, let's talk a little bit about the reality of food deserts. You know, what are they and where are they most prevalent? I'll just start with Keegan. I feel like I'm yeah. starting all sure. Yeah, so, <laughs> so food deserts are um, areas defined by the uh, U.S. Department of Agriculture that have a limited access to grocery stores. And it's usually... Um, there's, there's varying degrees, but if you don't live within walking distance of a grocery store, so a half mile to one mile of a grocery store, you're a USDA designated food desert. And when you look at where food deserts exist, they disproportionately affect communities of color. And we do, we show in the film, you know, an overlay of food deserts in the city of Baltimore. And they clearly are defined by the racial demographic of the community. And food deserts are disproportionately affecting, you know, people often say it's a, an issue of poverty, but a equally poor white and black American have different rates of access to healthy foods. Black Americans have less grocery stores, even if they're just as poor as their white counterpart. So it, it shows that racism plays a role in this. Um, Food deserts, though, a lot of times people think of them as just urban areas, but we also go to Navajo Nation and show this you know, massive area, an area the size of West Virginia, that has only about a dozen grocery stores for the entire population. So it also is affecting you know more rural and um, and more spaced out communities than just dense urban centers. Yeah, and I suppose if you don't have a car and you're forced to either take a bus or walk to a grocery store, I mean, just very practically, that just limits how much food you can actually bring back to your house versus, you know, just walking down to um, the convenience store and picking up some chips and, and soda, um, you know, et cetera. So, and this is like really, yeah, as you say, the the sad reality that's pervasive, you know, not just in, you know, inner city communities, but, but you know, in, in rural communities as well. But it, I mean, I, I will say when I saw that graphic in the movie where you overlaid the food desert prevalence on top of um, communities of color, it, it looked like the red line districts um, where essentially people could not get mortgages and, and essentially were, um, you know, pushed out of the opportunity to develop intergen intergenerational wealth through home ownership. And I looked at that graphic and I'm like, Oh my God, it's, it's basically the exact same graphic. It, it um, is the same graphic. Actually, we talked about putting graphic. it in the, in the film, but we thought, Oh, it's just going to, you know, it's a whole nother subject, but those are, <laughs> those food deserts are the red line districts. Mm. And so it's exactly that. it's like, and you know, and, and so the, the legacy of redlining and for the audience not familiar with it. Yeah. You know, the people uh, of color not being able to get mortgages in these communities because they're predominantly black or brown, that has still exists today because businesses don't want to do business in black and brown communities because of their own racist bias. And and it's not because there's, you know, there's not money because you look at all the businesses that are in these communities, they're highly profitable. They're making millions of dollars because people are eating. People have to eat. They will just eat what is available. And so uh, a scrupulous company um or a company who yeah who just doesn't care about people they just care about money they'll go in there they don't they don't mind at all uh yeah. and so that's a that's part of the film as well 
Yeah. So I don't know if you looked at numbers or prevalence of fast food in these neighborhoods, and it, it almost kind of goes without saying. Um, but, you know, for people that are new to the concept of food deserts or the availability of nutritious, actual, real food, um, you know, the prevalence of KFC, Wendy's, Burger King, McDonald's, et cetera, um, is just, you know, it's overwhelming. Um, and I think, you know, you draw um, some parallel in the film between food that you're going to get at some of these establishments with food that you might come across in other kinds of institutions. I wonder if you could just pull on that thread for a minute. Yeah. Go ahead, Keegan. I see the smile. Uh, you got, uh, you I was waiting for you, John. But yeah, the <laughs> I, um, <laughs> go ahead, John. No, no, no. I was just saying. I saw the smile. It looked like you were like you had it ready to go. <laughs> yeah, it, it's the, the you know you look at the uh, the plate of what's being served in public schools versus what's being served in hospitals, what's being served in prisons. They're all the same. They're all the same food manufacturers and distributors. And the thought that you would be feeding people foods that are known by the World Health Organization to be causing cancer, you know, group one carcinogen and group two carcinogens, feeding people who are, have no choice, like in prisons, um, foods that are known to be detrimental to their health, like, uh, you know, sadly, black Americans are disproportionately more likely to be in prison than white Americans. And yet they're forced to eat dairy, which, you know, half to three quarters of Americans of color are can't digest dairy. And so you look at, again, all these different things where things are knowingly done to communities of color and it's using food as a, as a tool of oppression and violence. Yeah. And even, even take it a step further, you know, we talked about like, you know, the incarceration rate for, for black and brown people being locked up is so much for the same crime as somebody that's white. The sentences are harsher for that person. And then you may have somebody that's, in jail for a nonviolent crime, and then they end up working in a meatpacking company as their as their work release. And so it's like you're not even there for a violent reason, but now you're there cutting up dead bodies over and over and over. We we've, we've seen the rates of disease that come out of these type of you know establishments, and not only that, the psychological aspect that this has on a person. And again, we're not saying that it doesn't happen to white people, but if you look at the ratio of what happens to black and brown people, as opposed to white people, the white people are more collateral damage if you're not the 1%. The 1% doesn't care who you are. They don't care if you're, you know, black, white, Latino, Russian, Slovenian, whatever, you know, and I always say this, I say, if you really think I'm, I'm lying, all the people that, and this is no knock on any particular uh, politician, but the same way those people go in and plead for votes after they get in the, into office, try to walk up to them and just ask them a question. Security is going to slam you to the ground before you even get up to them. You know what I'm saying? If you're not a part of that percentage, they really don't care. So you're just collateral damage at that point. Yeah. I mean, I think there has finally been some bipartisan support for criminal justice reform, but certainly, well, I mean, this goes back hundreds of years, but we won't do that necessarily here. But even just from the Southern strategy to the war on drugs, to the crime bill, to mandatory minimums, to the privatization of prisons, et cetera, that that whole syndrome that basically started with Nixon um, and, you know, pervaded um, you know, through all of these unequal laws, for example, the sentencing laws around cocaine versus crack, all of this, this kind of stuff that led to a, you know, disproportionate amount of, of people of color in, in prisons. And then, of course, you know, the rise of the private prison industry that then, you know, has all these donors and, um, you know. You got, you got you know, people so, with stock in this yeah. industry. Like, think about that. You got people that own stock in the private prison industry. Like yeah. they're making and, money. And, they're like, no, we need more prisoners. Cause you know, my investors, we got to do this. Let's go. Where can we find more prisoners? Hey, let's go over here to this community. I, get, I guarantee we can find them over there. 
Yeah. And, and of course, there's actually groups of corporate executives and legislators that are, um, you know, conspiring to actually write legislation to, you know, perpetuate the the building and, and propping up of private prisons. Now, I think, you know, some of the trends have gotten a little bit better uh, in that respect or, or on that topic. But, you know, the, um, the forced prison labor uh, issue that you guys bring up in, in the film is just, um, you know, mind boggling. The, the idea that someone who is serving time for a nonviolent crime then gets um, pushed out against their will to go work on a CAFO. Um, so can you maybe describe for a moment what it is like to be on a CAFO, uh, what it is? Because, John, I know that you visited that, um, that pig animal um, or um, that pig, I don't know, I guess basically CAFO. Was a, it basically was yeah. a basically a purgatory for pigs. That's what it was. Because yeah. they don't, they maybe... don't actually slaughter them there, but they hold oh, them see. there. Yeah, so they'll get them in five <laughs> weeks. Yeah. They get they get the pigs in five weeks. They feed them, and that's pretty much it. They feed them and pump them through, full of antibiotics and drugs while they're there. And then at twenty five weeks, they take them to the slaughterhouse. Now the the funny part is is that ninety seven percent ninety seven right, Keegan ninety seven percent of all, uh, or is it ninety nine? Actually, I think it is ninety nine percent of all meat sold in America comes from a place like this. Comes from a CAFO. Um, mm -hmm. So everybody that's always like, oh, I get grass fed and I get organic. It's like just because you got grass fed doesn't mean they're still not getting all these antibiotics. And also that grass fed doesn't mean they're out in the pasture. These pigs never saw daylight. They never see daylight. They come in at, 20, at five weeks. They live on these wooden planks. And it reminds you of, and it hit me while I was there, if you ever look at the slave ships that came over. They had little slots in the bottom of the of the boat so that if somebody had to defecate, they just went in the slots and they kept going on about their day. Same thing with these pigs. They don't get washed off. They don't get any kind of like love and attention. They're literally just sat there for 20 weeks on top of each other. If one gets sick, all of them are getting sick. But if all of them get sick, are they not going to sell their meat? No. They're still going to yeah. sell their meat. You know what I'm saying? Like... So just to be there and the smell and the just the aura of being there was just and I've been I was a butcher at one point. So I've been around this kind of thing, but it was just so concentrated at this time. It was hard to take in. Yeah, and all of the most recent studies seem to indicate that pigs actually have a high degree of sentience. Um Oh yeah. So the notion that, oh, well, these are just animals and they don't really know any better and, uh, you know, they're not really suffering any harm. Well, yeah. that's been disproven by science. Bull, well, bull, yeah. bull stuff or pig stuff in this instance. Yeah. Um, but Keegan, yeah. there, there's one part and Keegan got to witness it because he caught it on camera. We, I, we didn't necessarily show it in the film, but there's when we first walk in, as soon as the farmer walks in, and I, and I hate to call him farmer because... Farmer, I think of plants and vegetables. This is more like just a concentration camp, you know, whatever. So as he walks in, you literally see the pigs up against the fence. They part. They just run to the back of each cage as he walks towards the back. And as I walk in, they all kind of like come back towards the fence. Like, oh, my God. Like, not that they know I'm vegan or anything, but they're like, hey, this guy, done, this guy's never done anything to us or you know, it was just so interesting to see how, like you said, they're smart. They knew. They're like, oh, my God, here comes this guy again. Let's move. Like, get away. We don't know what's going to happen. And and think about this. This is not even a slaughterhouse. This is just the, basically, like I said, this is the holding cell, purgatory. So they already knew that vibe from just this one guy when he comes in. But when Keegan and I started to walk in, they were kind of like, oh, man, like, hey, what's up? Like, how you doing? Like, save me, pretty much. Yeah, this is a, just a highly effective part of the film 
just for, for those who are listening who don't know exactly what we're referring to, but basically John goes to this this CAFO for pigs, essentially, and uh, and meets the proprietor who is incredibly transparent. I mean, which is it's amazing actually how transparent he is, given what he knows that he's doing. Um, and you capture a, a moment with him off mic uh, that is just uh, kind of startling. It's an amazing part of the, the film where he essentially cops to, to, to knowing, you know, the, the harm that he's causing. Um, he yeah. was just, he was just older and just doesn't give a damn anymore. Like, and the crazy part was that was literally the second time he said it because Keegan was outside getting drone footage while I was still conversating with him. And when he made that quote, which when you see the film, everybody, you'll understand what we're talking about. But when he yeah. made that quote, I was like, hey, can you say that again? He was like, yeah, sure. And I, I literally, I mean, I run outside and I'm Keegan, get your shit. We, you, you won't believe what he just said. And I told Keegan, he was like, you think he'll say it again? I'm like, oh yeah, he'll say it again. We go back in and he says it again and then laughs. After all that, like, yeah, I do it. So what? Yeah, and of course, all of this behavior is um, perpetuated and constructed to prop up a myth that we need to get protein from animals. Um, so I wonder if you could just talk a little bit about un untangle that mythology, because now, of course, we're seeing you know documentaries like yours. I mean, John, obviously like you're an athlete and you're ripped. I mean, you're a specimen. I just interviewed this dude on the show last week named Simon Hill. I think you might know him. I mean, yeah. the guy is essentially like a bodybuilder. Obviously the, the documentary game changers features all sorts of athletes. So there's this been this mythology that has been perpetuated for a long time that in order to actually have muscle, that you need to eat animal protein. Um, can you tackle that for a minute? Uh, yeah, I mean, I'd like yeah, to jump in before. because because it's it's not that long. You know, we we think that it's been a long time that you had you know we've been told you have to eat meat to get muscle, but you know, prior to World War II, meat consumption was really low in the United States and around the world, and it's only with the advent of chemical agriculture. And synthetic fertilizers that have allowed us to grow more crops that makes grain cheaper than feed to livestock and keep them in these factory farms that has made cheap and make meat cheap is when we've seen this incredible increase in marketing that meat is associated with muscle or meat is associated with masculinity but historically for human populations very few populations ate a predominantly meat diet you know people in the far north um they may have had a predominantly meat diet, but they're a tiny, tiny fraction of the human population. Most people, you know, animal consumption makes about less than 10% of their daily calories. And so it's really, it's just been a marketing push since the, the 40s and 50s to increase meat consumption. And it's really clever, really smart marketing, but it's nothing more than that because you can look at, yeah, I mean, as you mentioned, the blue zones, these are populations who eat less than 10% of their Calories come from animal products, and there's the healthiest, longest living people on the planet. And then, yeah, we have films like The Game Changers, or anybody who's a lifelong vegan or vegetarian, like myself, I haven't never eaten meat, and I'm still going strong. I haven't eaten anything <laughs> from an animal in 25 years. I'm still going strong. Um, it's clear, you know, evidence that we don't need to eat these things. And anything that you could get from an animal, you can get from plants in a healthier form. It's not loaded with saturated fat and cholesterol and you know, carcinogens. Yeah. I mean, all you really just need to do is look at a horse and the muscle definition on a stallion um, to come to the realization that you do not need to eat animal protein to develop muscle. Um, and of course, um, <laughs> of course, <laughs> you don't actually when you eat protein, it's not like that then just miraculously appears in your bicep. <laughs> you <laughs> I know, wish. I wish. Oh, it, right? man, I wish. <laughs> <laughs> it's uh, every human cell in your body actually generates and produces protein out of building blocks called amino acids. Amino acids. And 
um, your body is so miraculous that it self generates endogenously 12 of those amino acids. And then they're called these essential amino acids, which are these nine amino acids that you need to get exogenously from diet. And so they are actually in meat, but they're also in every single plant and in things like quinoa and legumes in high amounts. And there is absolutely, there's no difficulty in obtaining those essential amino acids in a plant-focused or plant-based diet, zero. Um, and that's all your body needs uh, at the cellular level to actually build proteins. You actually make proteins yourself. So that whole idea that like you have to eat yeah, proteins. Yeah, you're speaking rationally just like now, <laughs> Jeff. You're speaking <laughs> rationally and it's just, that doesn't work in today's world. You can't, you got to be angry and like spit at the yeah. screen when you do it. Like you can't <laughs> okay. talk rational. That doesn't work anymore. <laughs> I'll, I'll try that. It's it's hard to talk about <laughs> amino acid building blocks and lysine and phenylalanine and, and spit at the screen at the same time. But I'll try. Um, but, <laughs> you, you, you know, I mean, I, I think like one thing that I really just do want to underscore here in this discussion, which the film brings to light is basically the powder keg situation that is created in disadvantaged communities f specifically around heart disease. So heart disease emerges as a combination of different caustic or noxious inputs. One, so inflammation. So when your vascular system, which is basically pushing oxygen and blood um, and glucose and around your body so your cells can make energy and proteins etc you know that system wants to be sort of glassy kind of like a zamboni just actually went over the ice at a hockey game if you've ever been to a hockey game you see that zamboni, zamboni. go over use the zamboni it, I, this has this to be the first interview i've ever been in where zamboni reference actually made it in i mean <laughs> you can you, i'll lease this out license free to you because it's a good one it's like you put the puck on the ice after the zamboni went over and the puck just moves by itself down to the other end you know and that's what your circulatory system or your vascular system should be like it should be glassy smooth and and dynamic and in situations where you come across a lot of caustic elements or toxins where you know you're dealing with a lot of air pollutants or herbicides like glyphosate for example or smoking or drugs or alcohol what that does to your vascular system is that it pocks it up like a bunch of hockey players with their ice skates pocking up the ice and if you've ever been at the hockey game at the end if you haven't like gotten your teeth knocked out or whatever you'll notice that if you drop the puck on the ice it doesn't go anywhere because the, the ice is all pocked up from the skates. Well, that's what's happening inside your arteries and your veins um, when you are coming across toxins. It basically pocks up the, the endothelial wall, basically, that is the, the wall that, that is supposed to remain kind of smooth and glassy. So that's the first part. And then the second part is you enter... Uh, like a high saturated fat diet with high in cholesterol from, you know, processed meats and dairy, et cetera, and low density lipoproteins. We don't have to go too deep into that, but basically LDL or bad cholesterol lodges in these pocked up marks. And so, and then it forms plaques and atherosclerosis and coronary artery disease, which can uh, result in in a, in a heart attack in your heart or, you know, a stroke um, in your brain. And the rates of this particular kind of disease and syndrome in uh, amongst black Americans is like, it's like 50%, I think is what you point out in, in the movie and what the situation for developing that it's just a powder keg because you have all of the ingredients for toxins and inflammation in a community and then you're feeding that community with the processed foods and the processed meats that basically combine with that it literally is the equation for heart disease yeah. <laughs> so it's like um yeah. yeah so it's uh you know for people that are actually trying to like put 
the equation together, it's sitting right there. It's not a mystery. It's a conspiracy hidden in plain sight, basically. Um, I, I, honestly, I don't even think there's anything to answer. You just explained it so yeah. well. Like, <laughs> but but I, I will I will I will double back on that with you. And I will say that, you know, for for people that are visual, like I like to talk visually too, it's like you you take those pots and basically what were divots in the veins and the arteries now they become uh basically like speed bumps so now they mm-hmm. got, they start to develop inside and they're taking away the, from the flow of everything so now you're starting to get the congestion of the of the of the arteries and the plaque and all these different things that are happening so it's like it starts off okay maybe it went to like a divot now you got like little scratches no scratches get inflamed and now they come into like actual roadblocks. Now, how is it going to flow freely? And now all it takes is one. And like what we talked about in the film is, and if it, if that speed bump busts, now you just got this rush of all this bad toxin going through your body and it's going to make another one down the line. And so it's just, it's a repeated, a repeated sequence over and over and over that, I'm not, again, I'm not saying that veganism is a hundred percent, but veganism isn't causing the death that's happening to these people. No, in fact, it, I mean, the good news here is that it actually doesn't take long to turn your body around. Like your body so desperately wants to heal (laughs) when, when fed the right ingredients. I mean, and, you know, you interview the the New York mayor elect, Eric Adams, who is mm-hmm. obviously a big proponent of uh, a plant based lifestyle. And he suffered from type two diabetes. And he very graphically in the film, and I've heard him do this other places too, talks about how quickly his all of his metabolic indicators went down his blood pressure went down his glucose level blood glucose levels went down his eyesight improved kind of inflammation in his joints improved mm-hmm. i mean it's it's remarkable i mean just even 2 or 3 weeks of adopting uh, a, a new diet can make such a such a huge difference um so that's like i suppose the positive news in the whole equation yeah. um yeah, I mean, it's and, the, the yeah. number one killer in the world is heart disease. And the only diet that's ever been scientifically proven to reverse the number one killer in the world is a plant based diet. So, yeah. yeah, there is hope and there are solutions. And it's right there. But there are a lot of powers and a lot of uh, governments and corporations and people who don't want that information out there. And they are going to limit your ability to get to a healthy plant based diet. Yeah, perfect segue. So, Let's get into the who are they and they are trying to kill us. What is this constellation of organizations and groups uh, that are aligning to preserve these systems that are clearly detrimental to human health? So, oh, sorry. Yeah, not to give away too much of the, not to give too much away of the film, but there is we've we discovered while making it that there is this interconnectedness between fast food manufacturers uh, processed food manufacturers the entire healthcare system whether that's hospitals uh, insurance providers um, pharmaceutical companies obviously and that they're all working together to keep people sick and and you could say well they're not actually trying to keep people sick because you know they just really want to make money but when you start to see who's on the board of what organization or what corporation and then where they come from, it starts to be very um, hard to argue that there is not a conspiracy to keep people sick because sick people make money. And if you can feed people garbage food, they're going to need pharmaceuticals, especially if you hide the information of solutions. And so they're going to be paying twice. They pay for the meal and then they pay for their drugs. And then they're probably going to end up need surgery. They're going to be in the hospital. So they're, you're going to, someone's going to get paid there. And they're going to keep eating that garbage food because they have no other option because of the communities that they live in and because of how policies are set up. And so you start to see that all of these people are making money off of sickness and death. And it's not for anything to, to help people because 
pharmaceuticals don't cure diseases by and large, or maybe some exceptions. They treat the symptoms of the disease. You can take high blood pressure medication. You're not cured of high blood pressure. You just don't have the symptoms of high blood pressure. You're still probably going to die of, of, of a stroke. You're still probably going to die of some sort of cardiovascular disease, but your symptoms aren't going to be there. And same thing with type 2 diabetes. It's, none of these things are really solving the problem, but people are making a lot of money off of them. So that's that's kind of the the climax of the film shows. And we name names, you know, in, in our previous films, we've kind of beaten around the bush and shown, you know, Cowspiracy says, well, there's a conspiracy. And we, we point to some places, what the hell, if we do this, the same in this film, we didn't hold back. We said, "Hey, look, we're gonna <laughs> we're gonna say who who these people are and what their names are and who where they work." And um, there, it does seem like there is a very concerted effort by corporate elite and you know just unabashed capitalists to make money off of the expense of people's lives and and their loved ones. So the the they is is them and the us you know really is is more because the film is african-american centric it is more towards the community of color is the us but the reality and as john said earlier it's all of us it's all of us who have been tricked into eating this way and have believed that this is what we're supposed to eat we're all suffering from this though some communities are suffering at a disproportionately higher rate and we can't forget there are some government bodies that are included in this too, um, mm-hmm. which are assisting and allowing them to do it. And, and and I always say that you know it's not that the people that are so you know un, in quotes in power right now that they're the ones who set this ball in motion, but they're not doing shit to change it. So it's like okay, if you're not doing anything to change it, what do they say? If you're not a part of the solution, you're part of the problem. And you know, it's real easy to for people not to understand that, oh, why wouldn't they change? But, you know, we all know at least everybody I know at least knows one pharmaceutical rep, one in your whole lifetime. You know, one pharmaceutical rep, this pharmaceutical rep probably makes at least a six figure salary every year. They drive to whatever doctor's office, they promote whatever drug, whatever apparatus, whatever device, whatever it is to the doctor's office. They know the side effects. They know the test studies. They know everything, but they still go to this doctor's office every day. They get in their BMW They go or, or whatever company car. They probably got a BMW at home, a nice house, and they're only making six figures. So imagine we're talking about an industry that is literally in the trillions of dollars. So I always tell people, if you really want to think about it, why wouldn't they want anybody to get better? Because if 10 percent, because we're not saying that all medication is bad, like Keegan said, you know, we need some medication. Don't get me wrong. But you got Lipitor, you got, you know, all these different medicines out there that aren't necessarily needed that could actually be uh, a lifestyle change in this person's life that could alleviate all that. So if you got that portion of people that don't necessarily need it, if they get 10% of those people to get off medications, that whole industry would implode. Mm. And if you don't think about that, anybody with a calculator right now, if it's a trillion dollar industry, take 10% of a trillion dollars and tell me that this whole industry won't go down if 10% of those people get better. Yeah, I mean, that's one of the sticking points in the kind of what's been billed as the you know, the, the social safety net bill, uh, build back better, you know, the, the Biden bill, which was part of that bill, uh, much of which is actually quite progressive, to be honest, um, was supposed to be funded by the pharmaceutical company through savings to Medicare, through lowering, uh, Medicare, and Medicaid, through lowering pharmaceutical drug prices, because right now they're re- are completely artificially high. Um, I mean, what you have to pay for insulin, which is a direct result of another governmental policy, which is basically the farm bill, which issues subsidies to farmers and by extension, big food to produce GMO corn under the true cost of its production, such that it can be either fed to to livestock at CAFOs or refined into high fructose corn syrup to get added into 84% of what you find in the grocery store, which then spikes your glucose levels and makes you insulin resistant. (laughs) And so... Mm -hmm. 
it's, you know, when you begin to actually unpack the component parts, the mechanism of what's going on, you know, you realize exactly what you just said, that there is no interest in reversing disease, because then how can you sell someone Lipitor? How can, you know, if you, and the thing about like a statin or insulin, I mean, you're taking it virtually every day of your life for the rest of your life. I mean, that yeah. you're, that's just money in the bank, you know? Um, so, so, you know, I mean, I, I really have a hard time untangling all of this because I actually really believe in the good nature of people. And so then, you know, I look, but then I look at like how. Not, not to cut you off, Jeff, but yeah. before you keep going, I always have a quote I say with that. People are good nature. Organizations are fucked up. Yeah. Well, systems and <laughs> yeah, systems and structures. The, system. the people yeah. are good natured, but once they get in that organization, they're like, "Well, I can't." Again, tradition and peer pressure. I can't go away from that because, oh my gosh, what'll happen to me? So that's the, the people are by nature good hearted, but they're influenced. Yeah. Brainwashed. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, the, the other, I, I guess this, this misalignment between, you know, industry and, and government agencies, I know you talk about the FDA and dietary guidelines um, that, and I think we touched on it kind of earlier in the conversation, but this whole idea of dairy being an essential food group is perhaps one of the greatest delusions of all time. Um, and, you know, Canada actually has come around on this. They issued their kind of government food guidelines, I think in 2019, and finally dairy was out of the equation. Dairy is just simply not a, a, an essential uh, ingredient to a diet. You can get calcium and vitamin D in myriad places. That you just absolutely don't need it. And as you guys point out in the film, um, you know, the, the excess estrogen and also obviously the, the cholesterol in dairy doesn't, is not doing anybody any good. So, but, you know, still like the FDA is sitting there like dairy, you know, part of one of the major food groups, you know, you, you know, drink a glass of milk every day. So this stuff is just, is, uh, is so backwards. And it's honestly, I think going to cripple the country because, you know, right now, what are we looking at? Like a three to four trillion dollar sick care industry. You know, what if that's five or six trillion dollars the way we're going, you know, the way we're trending? I mean, that's going to essentially bankrupt the economy. It's just, you know, so people just, you know, have to wake up. And I think that's part of what this film really helps people do is just to, to wake up. So, um, maybe we could talk a, a, a little bit about some of the solutions um, that that you guys get into in the film. And I guess as part of that, I'm hoping that you can address the idea of affordability because that often comes up in, in these kinds of discussions of like, oh, yeah, well, it's easy, you know, for you guys on like the coastal elite to to, you know, buy their uh you know regeneratively farmed cruciferi at your farmer's market um <laughs> but um but you know is it really affordable to eat a plant-based diet so maybe spend some time unpacking that yeah i mean I, if i can just jump in um most of the world who lives off of less than a dollar a day eat a plant-based diet. So when people argue that a plant-based diet is too expensive, it's like travel the world. The poorest people in the world do not eat meat, and dairy, and eggs three times a day. They just don't because those are really expensive. Those are resource intensive foods. Uh, a plant-based diet in the United States, yeah, it can seem cost prohibitive if you want to eat the standard American diet, but a vegan version, you know, plant-based meats and plant-based cheeses and plant-based eggs and all this processed stuff. Yeah, those are, those are expensive. Put them on comparison though, to, um, the animal products that they're emulating or simulating. They are, are pretty comparable in price. It might be 20% more expensive, but the 
once you realize that and you say, okay, well, this isn't that expensive, it's access to it. And that can be the biggest barrier is that mm. getting access to whole foods, whole fruits and vegetables, buying in bulk, um, fresh produce. You know, if you live in a community that only has a bodega and, you know, convenience store and a fast food place, it's hard to buy fruits and vegetables. And especially if you don't have a vehicle and you work three jobs or two jobs and you've got, you know, your single parent, like these, these are the other challenges that make it really hard to eat plant-based affordably because if you have all these other financial barriers, but a plant-based diet is around the world, everywhere I've ever been, the most uh, cost-effective, most affordable way to eat. And that's not just eating rice and beans three times a day. That's a varied diet. So on our website, uh, they're trying to kill us.com. We have a meal plan that was created by plant-based on a budget, Tokyo, uh, Tony Akimoto. And it's all the food that you need for a week. And it's less than $25. And so it's just like, that's you're on a fixed income, you're on SNAP or some sort of federal food assistance program, you can do that. And and it's a varied uh, menu. It's not the same thing every single day. And so we really encourage people, that's a free meal plan. They can just download it um, or they can look at it or if they don't have access to a computer, but they're listening to this, you can share this with somebody else and get them that meal plan because it is really can be very effective. But again, the hurdle is getting these foods into these communities and making it easier for people to access them. Yeah, I don't want to come behind that. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I have a well. There's a congressman, Tim Ryan, who's a good friend of mine, um, and he's one of the only Congress people who are who's really trying to push for reform of the Farm Bill. And uh, he wrote a book actually on regenerative farming, um, and he helped actually pass a bill that allowed people to redeem SNAP online. Um, oh, yeah. So. Um, so, for example, there's online delivery companies like Thrive Market and um, I don't know, maybe Whole Foods does it through Amazon too, though I'm not going to touch that one. But um, Yeah, they do actually. I just saw that now that, they, that you can use them on, uh, on Amazon. Yeah, because basically one of the issues that that solves is that if you live in a neighborhood where you cannot access uh, quality, you know, fresh fruits and vegetables, but there are delivery services with, you know, distribution centers in the general area that if you can redeem that snap online, you can actually get that food delivered, um, you know, which is huge. I mean, obviously it's like then educating folks that that actually exists and there's all sorts of obstacles and challenges, but, you know, at least it kind of helps pull sort of the, the thread through the eye of the needle a little bit. Um, and, you know, I'm sure, I mean, you guys actually profile a whole bunch of entrepreneurs, you know, in the film that are starting, um, you know, plant-based restaurants and you know, especially for, for black and brown communities. Um, and, and some of that messaging, you know, feels really uplifting. I, I know John, your friend also with John Sally, who I think has a, a number of, of businesses in that space too. Unfortunately, yes, I am. No, I'm just playing. <laughs> no, that's that's my mentor. That's that's like my my big brother, man. But yeah, like yeah. you know, there there is a lot of a lot going on, and 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 to go along with what Keegan said, you know, when you are comparing prices of vegan food to non-vegan food, you also have to understand that like you're paying for what is not subsidized in comparison yeah. to what is subsidized. So on the back end, these other foods are subsidized. So like when we talked about the Big Mac, you know, being, you know, three or four dollars in, in the restaurant. But if you took all the subsidies out, it'd be around eleven dollars. Now you compare that to a vegan burger. Now, what are we talking about? But they don't they, they hide that cost from you because they don't want you to know about that. And, and with anything else, you know, you're paying for the labor that went into it. Yes, it may be a vegan product, but somebody had to make that vegan product. It's like we all can make our own house, but who's about to get out there with the drill and the hammer and the wood <laughs> and start going for it? Like, and it might not even be the house I want at, by the time I get done with it. But I know somebody <laughs> that's an expert, just like with food, that can make that food taste like I wanted to, just like with the house. So I think there's a lot of factors that we don't take into consideration and, and you know, we we've been so spoiled with the with the industrialization of the world that we think we got to eat something different every day. You know, I'm I, 
King will tell you, I'll eat the same thing every day for a year. And I do it. I do it all the time. So we just been so spoiled. It's like before the industrialization of the world, if you grew up next to a mango tree, what would you eat every day? You ate damn mangoes. That's what you ate. And you probably lived to be 100 because you weren't, you know, bogging yourself down. So uh, Chef Charity Morgan, um, whose husband is in the film, we didn't interview her, but, you know, everything that's going on. She always has a great idea. I always say, if you're going to make rice and beans every day, make five different sauces for the week. So now, because she has kids and she always says that's how she tricks her kids. So now I made a batch of rice and beans. And she doesn't do this all the time. She's using an example. You make a batch of rice and beans. Now you got this salsa verde sauce today. You got this pico de gallo sauce today. You made a vegan ranch today. You made you made all these different sauces. So the kids are getting a different taste every day. They're not like, oh man, this is the same thing. And it works for adults too. So it's just ways around getting rid of the brainwashing to take a step back and say, oh, you know what? This isn't as bad as they made it look. Yeah. I mean, one of the points you make about the externalizing or the externalization of costs is such a big point. Um, I think, you know, I saw some advertisement, which was like four for four, you know, is like a cheeseburger, fries, nuggets, and a Coke for four bucks. And you're yeah. like, how could you possibly generate that many calories for four dollars? It's just yeah. seemingly impossible. And, uh, you know, but of course, when these industries are completely subsidized, and producing this kind of food under the true cost of production, well, you are actually subsidizing that as a taxpayer. And then you're mm -hmm. subsidizing it on the other side when the consumer of that particular four for four has to go to the emergency room with cardiac arrest. So then you're paying for it again on that side. So not to mention, you know, the, the, the methane emissions that are happening on the CAFO or, you know, the disease um, that's happening kind of, you know, within um, these animal operations. So, you know, I mean, these are kind of, these are what has to change really, I, I suppose, at a government or a policy level is really trying to get um, companies and, and and food purveyors to internalize the true costs of a product. And then as consumers, we can decide, oh, okay, well, am I going to spend 30 bucks on a steak? Well, maybe once a month, but not five times, six times a week, you know? So, yeah. Yeah. Anyways. It it's a, a funny thing to me because a lot of the people who would be railing against socialism and, you know, government being involved in industry will stay totally silent on this subject, right? Or people who are like advocating for libertarianism be like, all right, yeah, let's see what the actual market, what is actually going to cost because you're going to see a lot more plant-based people if you take away the government influence. And again, I'm not making an argument for either one or the other, but it's like, that's a major part of it is that we have these programs that are propped up by the federal government and we would not be eating this way if it wasn't for that and the only reason why we have a government that props these things up is because of the corporate influence and they put pressure on policymakers to push through these policies that don't benefit anybody but the corporation yeah yeah i mean and, and you think about just what it is like to be ill every day what that experience is like like who are you when you have type two diabetes or when you have COPD or when you have an autoimmune disease like Crohn's or IBS, or if you have colorectal cancer, like who are you? Who, how do you show up every day? I mean, it, it's hard. It's so hard. And, you know, we wonder then why people are depressed and why people are addicted and why by extension society feels so angry and politically polarized well it's a direct reflection of the inflammation that's happening on the inside is being reflected in this societal inflammation and it's just right there in plain in plain sight for for people to see so 
Anyways, my, uh, yeah. <laughs> my my wife Shani likes to say, "Eat like shit, feel like shit, treat people like shit," and yeah, that's what yeah. ends up happening. And it's for all of us, you know. I, if I eat garbage, you know, I'm still plant based. But if I eat a bunch of fatty food, I'm not going to feel well, and I'm not going to treat people around me well. And so it's like, just take away even the chronic disease aspect of it. You, if you don't feel well, it's really hard to be a positive, nice person. And so, yeah, change people how they eat. You're going to change everything in their life. Yeah. Be tolerant with others and strict with yourself. <laughs> yeah, there you go. Um, so where can we find uh, the film? How can we support all the work that you're doing? Uh, help the, the listener out to, to find you. So we did a limited release of the film for one month. And um, we are working on a distribution plan right now to get the film out as widely as possible. We can't divulge anything just at the moment, but we really want to encourage people to go to our website. They're trying to kill us.com sign up for the newsletter so they can stay up to date when the film becomes available on a major wide stream mm -hmm. um, wide platform and, and stay up to date with that, but they can see the trailer. They can um, sign up for the meal planner. They can um, help support the film with, uh, we have merchandise that helps again, gets the message out there and all of the funds that the film brings in um, the first million dollars that the film makes, we are donating to charity. So any sort of financial support people want to give to the film in any which way is deeply appreciated, but everything can be just found through their trying to kill us.com. Nice. And also they can, you know, people, people forget how, how powerful of a voice they have. Like you can request movies on platforms. And if enough people request on your favorite platform, I'm not going to say any names, any platforms. If you request your favorite platform or platforms that helps not just our film, but any film that you like, it's like going to a store. You know, if they don't have the product that you like, I guarantee if you go to, you know, OH or, or, you know, whatever you want to go, whatever story you want to go to, if you request it enough, they'll say, oh, we can get that. You know, like, oh, let's check with our distributor. Same thing with film. You know, if you request it enough, people will, will find us and get it on there. Yeah. Well, everybody needs to see this film. I guess my last question for you guys is, uh, and I think everyone should know this because it, it does add, of course, a little bit of star power to it is, is, you know, Chris Paul and, and, um, Billie Eilish are, are, I, I guess the executive producers, is that right? Um, yeah. but are also, but are also featured in the film, yes. uh, with, with dozens and dozens of, uh, of luminaries. So, um, I, I, I'm not sure if you want to spend a minute talking about how those relationships um, developed and, um, but I, I certainly be something that I think would be interesting to, to dangle out there. Uh, as, as far as, uh, Chris goes, um, his team had actually seen the trailer and, um, they reached out and they were saying how like Chris would love to be involved. And so to be honest, it really developed into a friendship actually. Um, you know, we, we don't talk every day, but we, we do talk and he's, I'm always keeping him up to date and everything like that. But, um, no, it's just the team saw the trailer and they were like, Whoa, wait a minute. Let's, let's talk. And then we sat down and talked and we talked about interviewing. And then I, I brought the idea of possibly after, you know, conversing with Keegan brought up the idea of, you know, him possibly being an executive producer. And he was gung ho about it. He was like, yes. And that was without, even interviewing him yet. He didn't even know what his part would look like in the film. He didn't care. Um, as far as Billy goes, I've been friends with her mom, uh, Maggie, for some time, you know, through the plant-based movement, vegan movement. And uh, it was actually Maggie's idea. She was like, hey, you know, would it be, a, you know, what do you, do you have an executive producer yet? I was like, not yet. Uh, we're still working on it. She's like, what have you, what do you thought about Billy? And I was like, wow, that would be amazing. And I told her, I was like, as long as it's not like a white savior kind of thing, we're on board. And she was like, of course not. I totally agree. You know, we want to want her to lend her power and she could get the film in front of all of these people that normally wouldn't not necessarily care about a movie about black and brown communities, but just wouldn't look for it. So now right. this would be a way to, to get the, in front of their eyes, too, because like we said, we are in this all together, no matter what. If we are brothers and sisters 
if my brother and sister is hurting over there, I don't care what color they are. I want to help. I want to make sure I do the right thing for all of us. So it just goes along that, that uh, mind frame. Hey, thanks for watching. If you liked this interview from the Commune podcast, then I think you'll love this video right here. It's like taking you right now, Jeff. If I were to say, here's a gun and a badge, Jeff. And, you know, don't break the law. Don't do anything crazy, but go arrest that guy right now and, uh, and do so without hurting him or using your tools if you don't absolutely have to. The speed with which you would use your taser pepper spray baton <laughs> is 100 times faster than me or Hedon or anybody with a, even a percentage of our training.